Hello and welcome to Weathersnap. I'm Claire Nazir. Last weekend, Cyclone Freddy tore across Southeast Africa for the second time in a month, causing widespread devastation. It has caused tragic consequences. The death toll continues to rise. Worst hit have been the countries of Mozambique and Malawi. Winds and rain have destroyed properties and flooded huge swathes of land as the threat of cholera becomes a major concern. It's one of the longest lasting tropical storms ever recorded. I caught up with tropical prediction scientist Julian Hemming to understand why this cyclone became one of the deadliest storms in recent years. Julian, this is an incredible story which ended in pretty much disaster for, I'm going to say, millions of people. Tell me how Cyclone Freddy began its life. Cyclone Freddy actually began life to the northwest of Australia way back at the beginning of February. In fact, it was named on the 6th of February. And then it took a fairly straight westward track right across the Indian Ocean. So it took several weeks to reach the other side of the Indian Ocean. It came close to Mauritius and La Reunion, but then it made landfall over Madagascar and then re-strengthened in the Mozambique Channel and made a first landfall on Mozambique. And at that point, we might have thought it was going to dissipate. But in fact, the remnant moved back out over the ocean, re-strengthened, and then we saw another landfall over Mozambique, which made um, Freddie an extremely long-lived and and damaging storm. Cyclones don't tend to last this long, do they? No, there's there's several factors which determine how long a, a storm lasts. Firstly, Um, If it moves in a direction which takes it over land fairly quickly, then it'll uh, uh, dissipate uh, quite quickly. But of course, with Freddie, because it formed right over the eastern side of the Indian Ocean and the storms tend to move from east to west, then obviously it had a lot of warm ocean ahead of it. So it kept moving over new parts of warm ocean. So it was able to uh, keep its energy up. Could you estimate how many kilometres or miles Freddie actually travelled? Freddie was actually active for around 35 days in the end. And it, as as we've said, it's travelled right across the width of the Indian Ocean, which I think is in excess of 8,000 kilometres. But of course, it travelled further than that because it moved over land, then it tracked back out into the, um, into the Mozambique Channel and then did another drift uh, northwestwards towards its second landfall. Cyclone Freddie will be remembered for how long it just continued to be a tropical storm. What will it be remembered for in terms of impacts? Was it a wind event? Was it a rain event? Was it a bit of both? The main issues came with the landfalls over Mozambique because the first landfall occurred and then the remnant, even though the wind strength died down quite quickly, the remnant became very slow moving for almost a week. So that dumped huge amounts of rainfall over, at that stage, the southern parts of Mozambique. Um, we certainly saw widely five, six hundred millimetres of, of rain, some places locally as much as a thousand millimetres of rain. And then, of course, the storm moved back out over the Mozambique Channel. The second landfall was further north over Mozambique. And again, we've seen uh, several hundred millimetres of rain. And in fact, as Cyclone Freddy made its second landfall, it also strengthened. So it was up to the equivalent of hurricane strength again. And it was pounding with its strong winds, the city of uh, Kelimani on the coast of Mozambique. So we had some wind impacts there, as well as the rainfall which followed as it moved inland. Finally, this one has now dissipated. Are there any other storms in the vicinity which could affect the area again? We are getting towards the end of the southern hemisphere season, so we expect things to quieten down eventually, although that doesn't preclude the fact that there could be uh, another storm or two in the South Indian Ocean before the end of the season. Okay, Julian Hemming, Tropical Prediction Scientist here at the Met Office. Thank you very much for your insights. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Whilst chatting, Julian also mentioned La Nina, whose influence can drive these huge tropical storms on a relatively straight track. We have now come out of a very long La Nina. It extended over three years or so. And already this global oscillation has resumed a neutral balance. One aspect of this conversation we didn't touch on is climate change. To detect the climate change fingerprint within Cyclone Freddy, further analysis needs to be done. Obviously, we'll keep you posted here on Weathersnap. What we do know about climate change here in the UK is that our winters are becoming milder. In this report, our wildlife expert and climate correspondent, Graham Madge, 
investigates whether climate change is having an impact on some of our favourite birds. That is the evocative sound of the Buick Swan, which escapes the harsh Russian Arctic winter by visiting the UK. These birds are wild and hardy and a world away from the mute swan of our parks and waterways. I caught up with Dave Painter, reserve manager of the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust headquarters at Slimbridge in Gloucestershire on the shores of the Severn. He has spent 40 years studying these birds. Britain is incredibly important as a wintering area for birds. Here at Slimbridge, we're the sort of far end of the Western European flyway. So birds are coming primarily from Arctic Russia, parts of Scandinavia, to winter here on the Western seaboard. So, you know, two, three thousand miles away. Some of our birds are coming from as far as four thousand miles. Uh, miles away, but on that flyway, so passing from the Arctic down to the Baltic and then across uh, into the Low Countries and ultimately to join us here in, uh, in Britain. These birds are regular visitors to the UK in winter. How are they doing? Are there any signs of changes in the population? For the, the Buick Swans in particular, well, there's two things going on. There is a genuine population decrease and then there's this short stopping effect of birds staying on the continent, not coming this far west. So the first effect is we're seeing fewer of them uh, and they are arriving a little later as well. You know, we always we, we have a, a swan sweepstake here at Slimbridge where we uh, predict when the swans are going to arrive. And if you got the 20th or the 21st of October, that was probably the plum date 20 years ago. Now it's early November. Should we be concerned that the numbers are declining in the UK? Numbers are falling. We've dropped from highs of, of, of several hundred here at Slimbridge. So uh, on occasions up to 600, but commonly four or 500 birds uh, wintering here. And that, that's gradually dropped down, but sort of levelled off a bit in the last few years. So we're down now, at the moment we've got 125, 130 birds here as well. But the overall trend is a steady decrease. These are very traditional birds they actually change very slowly many other species are more reactive they just go to where the conditions are right the um, geese and, and swans are very traditional they go to their traditional wintering sites and it takes longer for that tradition to be broken down but we can see that happening what effect is climate change having on the population of buick swans should we be worried about the impact of climate change I suppose that in the ideal world, populations can react to uh, those changes and, and always do react to those changes and they will move their breeding areas, move their wintering areas. A couple of worries for the Buick swans and bird population generally is the speed of this change. It's not happening over you know hundreds of years, it's happening over tens of years. So they've got to change very quickly, which they may or may not be able to do. For the Buick swans, we're also worried about the fact that their the breeding areas on the very northern edge of the continent. There's not a lot of extra land available for their breeding further to the uh, to the north. And the Arctic summer is only just long enough, you know, where they are at the moment. It's only just long enough for a big bird like a, a Buick swan to complete that breeding cycle. So even if there was more land available further north they might not actually have enough time in that brief Arctic summer to complete that breeding cycle. Uh, so yes, I think there are a few things to worry about. Uh, some we can influence and, and others we can't. Just before we go, here's Ollie Claydon with last week's highs and lows. Here are your extremes for Monday the 6th of March to Sunday the 12th of March. The mildest day was last Sunday when North Holt in Greater London peaked at 14.6 Celsius. There were some very cold nights last week. The temperature at Altnahara in Sutherland fell to minus 16 Celsius during the early hours of Thursday morning. The wettest place was North Wick in Devon, where 39.4 millimetres of rain fell last Wednesday. Finally, Tyree in Argyll was the sunniest spot, clocking up 10.8 hours of sunshine last Wednesday. Thanks, Ollie. That's it for Weather Snap. I'm Claire Nazir. Editor is Adrian Holloway. 
Weather Snap is a podcast by the UK Met Office. For the latest weather conditions where you are, download the Met Office Weather app.